Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you're uh, where you're listening. I'm Mike Rank, and I'm the managing editor of Hay and Forage Grower Magazine, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to this special webinar titled "Why Alfalfa." Today's webinar is being sponsored by our friends at WL Alfalfas, and it's going to include presentations from experts at Forge Genetics International. Uh, who you will meet very shortly. You know, I was thinking back in uh, 1899, W.D. Hoard, who is the uh, founding publisher of Hoard's Dairyman Magazine, actually purchased a dairy farm outside of Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, where I, where I sit today. And Interestingly, his main reason for, for buying the farm was not necessarily uh, to milk cows, uh, but rather he wanted to, to prove that alfalfa could and should be grown on dairy farms around the Midwest. And he was uh, more than successful in this endeavor. Uh, and the virtues he cited for the crop nearly 125 years ago uh, are as true today as they were back then. Even so, we are we are now finding that dairy producers, uh, including are including less alfalfa in cow diets, and as a result, uh, acres are declining. And there are some misconceptions that alfalfa uh, is not an economical feed ingredient. But there are also concerns about uh, lower yields compared to other crops. During the, the next hour, you're gonna hear about some of alfalfa's agronomic and nutritional advantages. And these include soil health enhancement, crop rotation benefits, uh, nitrogen contributions, and really, a lot of other ecosystem services that alfalfa provides. And along with these is the simple fact that feeding alfalfa results in numerous nutritional uh, benefits. So at this time, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Matt Minnis is a, a senior account manager for WL Alfalfas, having been with the company now for over seven years. And in this role, Matt supports distributors and dealers in the Midwest and Eastern Corn Belt by providing sales training, product training, and overall support for WL alfalfas. He's located in central Indiana and has a bachelor's degree in ag economics from the University of Illinois. Our next speaker, Dr. Emily Message, is the Product and Development Manager for Forage Genetics International. She's been with F FGI for over three years and initially joined the team as a, a technical support specialist, but in her current role, Dr. Message manages FGI's product portfolio and life cycling process develops alfalfa product and management training curriculum and manages industry and university forage partnerships. Dr. Message received her PhD from the University of Minnesota with a major in animal science. And then last but not least, you'll hear from Dr. David Weekly, who is the director of forage nutrition research at Forage Genetics International. Dr. Weekly began his career at the Ralston Perina Company, where he became the director of dairy research. In 2010, he joined FGI, where he developed advanced feeding and forage formulation algorithms for the Calibrate technologies. And throughout his career, he's directed more than 400 experiments that have resulted in over 30 US and international patents. Dr. Weekly was also integral in the development of Harv Extra Alfalfa, and he received his PhD in animal nutrition with an emphasis in biochemistry from Oklahoma State University. Our first speakers today will be Emily and Matt doing somewhat of a tag team, but before they begin, let's get into our first poll question. 
and uh, you won't have to show any uh, any valid picture ID. Everybody can vote here. So our first question is, what is your biggest barrier to growing alfalfa? Is it because it's labor intensive? There's profitability concerns, more focus on soybeans and corn, uh, equipment requirements, or risk management. So let's let the uh, votes come in here. So it looks like the uh, the winner here is more focused on soybeans or corn at 38%. Uh, then profitability concerns at uh, 25%, followed closely by risk management at 21%, and uh, less concern about labor and equipment requirements. So with that, uh, comments from you, uh, uh, Emily, and we'll get started. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for that introduction. And, um, you know, this is a really great way to get started with this um, webinar today just understanding you know what challenges are we facing out in you know the industry and, and why is alfalfa on the decline um, as mike had mentioned a little bit earlier so um so what we wanted to talk about today is you know why alfalfa is so critical and so important to be maintained on our in our cropping rotations um, as we know we've seen a decline in alfalfa acreage and unfortunately you know we see that this this is a significant loss and we're going to talk about some of those reasons here some of the information that we're going to cover today is probably well known by a lot of people attending this webinar and i'm so excited to see a large number of you on here um, but i think you know sometimes even though we might know this information we might not necessarily emphasize its value and its importance and so that's why we just want to revisit some of these concepts hopefully introduce some new concepts um, and talk about some firsthand experiences my colleague matt will be talking about some grower experiences that he has where he's seen a significant benefit of alpha alfalfa um, on, on farms and ranches. So to get started, you know, one of the things that we, we always put emphasis on in terms of farming is a lot of, of corn and soybean, as we saw in that first poll result, right? Um, even things like wheat is getting a lot of attention. We see cotton in certain areas, rice. But one thing that we need to, to remind ourselves is that forages, and in particular alfalfa, really plays a significant role in our overall agricultural industry. And so that's what I'm showing here in table one on this slide. We're just looking at kind of some major crops, some major industries, including cattle and calves, um, dairy, milk, and where they're ranking in terms of economic importance. And what's interesting is that when we line all of these up, you know, corn and soybeans, they're one and two, and they are consistently one and two. But alfalfa ranks typically number three. Last year, we did get pushed to number four behind wheat, but that's still an incredibly important crop um, for us in the agricultural industry. And so with that, you know, we want to be talking about not only is it economically important, but it's also important for our ecosystem as well. So starting here, um, if any of you have heard me talk before on sustainability, you've likely seen this table or some version of it. Um, I think that it's really a great way to summarize where alfalfa can fit in these different conversations. Sustainability has been a buzzword. It's been a hot topic. We're hearing people in, all the way up from government, through industry, um, all the way down to individual growers and consumer level. And so some of these buzzwords that they're talking about, you know, what does sustainability mean? things like carbon sequestration, improvements in soil structure, um, nutrient leaching. All of these are really important parts of, of things that we would include in the sustainability. And a lot of times people are associating things like cover crops, which is obviously a, an umbrella term for a lot of different species with sustainability. So we give a lot of rewards if people integrate cover crops into their rotations. Um, we talk about the benefits that they can have on soil health and even animal health. But we see that alfalfa is missing a lot of times in those conversations. And it, it's really unfortunate. When we look at that end goal of truly trying to improve our on-farm sustainability, we know that alfalfa could actually be the gold standard or is the gold standard in terms of providing those improvements. So with this table, I've got alfalfa in that first column there, 
corn and soybeans, again, just because they're the most common crops that we have on US acres. And then also those short-term or annual cover crops. And again, I wanna remind you that this is a wide umbrella term. It covers a lot of different species, annual legumes, annual grasses, brassicas, but they are all kind of lumped together there. And so when we go down these different rows, there, there are different sustainability benefits from carbon sequestration at the top, like I mentioned, reduced water erosion and wind erosion, nutrient leaching, improvements in soil microbial diversity, drought resilience, obviously that's incredibly important in a lot of areas um, as we've seen in the last two to three years and still going to be important even if we're getting adequate moisture and in some cases too much moisture in some areas. This is all gonna play a role here. And so when we look at in particular how alfalfa compares to those annual cover crops, Carbon sequestration, um, we have a lot of really positive research over the past couple of decades showing significant improvements in um, carbon sequestration when alfalfa is included in a rotation. We've also seen significant improvements when cover crops are included in rotation as well. Um, but I have talked to some researchers who are working pretty uh, uh, vigorously in this area. And with some of the research that they have done, they've told me that they see alfalfa being on the same level as, or at least on the same level as cover crops in terms of its ability to sequester carbon. And the cool thing about alfalfa is that because it has that really deep taproot, it's able to sequester carbon deeper into those soil layers, which helps us when we're talking about keeping carbon in the soil for longer periods of time. That deep taproot also lends itself to helping improve overall soil structure. Um, again, we, on average, you know, that deep taproot can grow about five feet a year, uh, depending on soil conditions, obviously. Um, but we have seen some alfalfa plants where they estimate the roots are going as far as 35 feet deep into that soil profile. Um, so again, that really helps to create those pores that we're looking for in that soil structure, um, as well as just, you know, improving overall nutrient leaching into those deep, not leaching, excuse me, nutrient mobility through those deeper layers, and also utilizing some of those nutrients and that moisture deep in that soil profile. Nitrogen credits, this is a big one and we're going to get into more details here in a couple slides, so I don't want to spend too much time here, um, but we know that alfalfa has the ability to, to provide a lot of nitrogen to following crops, um, more so than, than any other crop really that we've identified, even other perennial legumes, and so that's a really big bonus on um, an attribute of having it in a rotation. Reduced erosion, whether it be water or wind. Again, we have a lot of research that shows the, the holding capacity, basically, of um, alfalfa to that soil, and we're able to retain more of that soil, retain um, more of that, that overall organic matter in those fields and not have significant losses due to water and wind erosion. Decreased nutrient leaching, this is an interesting one. Um, again, that has to do with the ability for alfalfa to soak up those nutrients. We see this used in reclamation sites pretty uh, frequently. Um, the popular case was Aaron Brockovich. You know, if you guys have ever heard of that story or watched that movie um, where they had some significant toxic metal contamination, they actually planted alfalfa in those fields to help soak up some of those nutrients. So we know there's a lot of utility with alfalfa in those cases. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end too about wildlife habitat. We don't wanna forget that because again, that's a big part of the sustainability. If we're talking about a true overall ecosystem, healthy ecosystem, that's a big contributor as well. Water use efficiency, we don't have enough time to get into that today. Um, however, you know, feel free to reach out. We have a lot of materials that we're working on that's discussing alfalfa and water use and how effective alfalfa can be in some of these water scarce areas and why really it's a great crop to be growing um, in times of drought which then leads us to that last one, that drought resilience. And we just know that alfalfa has created in the rotation helps to create those more resi resilient soils. And when we have these periods of drought, periods of water scarcity, alfalfa is a great crop to have because it can basically go dormant when that water is shut off. But as soon as that water turns back on, that alfalfa plant has the ability to grow again. And we can't do that with our annual forages. So this is a form of risk mitigation in that, yeah, you may not necessarily be getting production off of it right now, but as soon as there's moisture available, it's gonna be able to grow and produce a crop again. So getting deeper into some of these concepts that I just covered, 
Um, you know, we know that alfalfa improves soil tilt. It improves soil structure. The size of those aggregates is really important. That is um, tied into, you know, decreases in erosion. We want to make sure that we have large pores um, for that water movement, for that nutrient movement throughout the soil. And this alfalfa in your rotation is going to help that. Part of it's due to the perennial nature and just the fact that we don't have to go in annually and be planting and working up that soil, that certainly helps. Also, just having that canopy cover throughout the entire growing season helps to reduce size of, of raindrops and we can see a significant improvement from that as well. This leads, like I said, to that decrease in erosion and runoff. There's been research that has found that alfalfa decreases erosion and decreases water runoff by about 2.7 times um, compared to fields that only have annuals in it. So that's pretty significant. And in my part of the country in Pennsylvania, where we have a lot of rolling hills, um, you know, it really does help on those slopes to make sure again that that soil is staying put. As I already mentioned, it's gonna increase that moisture, it's gonna increase that nutrient movement due to those tap roots. They're able to not only move it down to those deeper soil profiles, but also access those, that moisture and those nutrients in those deeper profiles as well. And overall, like I had already mentioned, this really does contribute to creating more stable soils so that it can weather through these periods of really dry, intense weather. And then, you know, once we do get moisture back, it's able to, to soak up more of that water and utilize more of that water. So this brings us to our first story from my colleague, Matt. He's gonna talk about a, an example that he has or a grower experience where they utilized alfalfa's benefit um, to help improve their overall soils. But also what's really cool with his story is that it shows how management can play a role and how technology within alfalfa can also play a significant role here as well. So Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Message. Yeah, I, have, I as, as Dr. Message mentioned, I have, I have an example of a dairy farm that really has been able to reduce their compaction challenges across their 2,500 acres of corn silage and alfalfa haylage. Now this, this large da dairy is milking 3,000 cows here in the Eastern Corn Belt and their biggest challenge is they farm on really tight clay soil types. So that's their biggest challenge. And uh, before Harv Extra, they were taking five cuttings uh, of alfalfa per year and really seeing those compaction issues and drainage issues manifest across those 2,500 acres. Now they were, er you know, they were early adopters of Harv Extra and the goal uh, of the trait was to utilize you know, the, a reduction in harvest and utilize that flexibility of the trait to go from five cuttings down to four cuttings a year. And that would allow them to only har take a harvest of their alfalfa when the soils were fit. And uh, so they, they converted, finished converting all of their al alfalfa acres over to Harv Extra in 2019. And uh, I visited them with them here this, uh, just this past fall after they put the button, uh, you know, put the bow on their corn silage harvest. And, uh, They've seen a tremendous tonnage improvement, you know, from what they mentioned to me in their corn silage that followed those, you know, those alfalfa fields that had those one less cut for the past three years. And uh, what really surprised them was, was a drastic improvement to the alfalfa plant's health. You know, they were seeing more persistent stands, faster green up between cuttings, and just better overall plant health uh, of their alfalfa stands, which, uh, you know, I was pleasantly surprised with that and uh, you know I asked them a little bit deeper about uh, you know how their tonnage and quality stacked up you know taking four cuttings versus what they were getting from five cuttings and they said it was indistinguishable they were still having a dairy quality hay you know with the four cuts that they were getting from five cuts just to, from the benefit of that harv extra trait and uh, you know they were getting the same you know right around the same tonnage you know e equals to the same tonnage with four cuts as they were getting from five. So I was, I was pleasant uh, with that. And one thing that, that we didn't mention when we visited was, you know, the cost savings, what they were saving by taking one less cutting per year, you know, less wear and tear. Um, and, you know, that what their ultimate goal was that one less trip across the field when the soil weren't, soils weren't fit, that was, uh, that was adding to that uh, compaction. And in closing, you know, I'm sure that Planting a WL Harv Extra variety like WL375 Harv Extra, you know, that has that ultra cut disease package, you know, I'm sure that that helped with that stand longevity and plant health, uh, you know, as the, as the, what they mentioned that they saw in, uh, in their example. 
Awesome. Back to you. That's a great story, Matt. And I think it just, again, shows you not, we already know that alfalfa in itself has benefits on overall soil rotations. We're going to talk more about that. But it also then shows how new technology really can amplify those benefits and, and increase their benefits even further. So very cool. So to tie into that then, talking about the benefits on our overall rotation, um, this is some research in this graph here from a UC Davis study um, where they were looking at how alfalfa, alfalfa can improve their a wheat rotation. And so what they did is they grew wheat after alfalfa and or alongside alfalfa as well. And what they had differing levels of nitrogen fertilization on that wheat after alfalfa. And so this line here, the solid line here, shows the wheat biomass following alfalfa. And then the dotted line here shows wheat following grains. And this says that it's kilograms per hectare. I actually went in and these numbers right here, the 0, 100, 200, and 300, uh, correspond to the pounds per acre, just to make it a little bit more um, clear here. So what they found was that really with, um, excuse me, with grains not following alfalfa, they had to apply a significant amount of nitrogen in order to match the grain biomass following alfalfa. Okay, so when we were looking at where the grain biomass caught up with grains following grains versus grains following alfalfa, they were applying at least 200 pounds per acre just to match then that simple rotation of adding that alfalfa in point. So that shows a significant cost savings um, by having that alfalfa just planted before those grains, utilizing some of that nitrogen credit. But another thing that we've seen too is that there's just this rotation benefit, this enhanced uh, rotation benefit, excuse me, enhanced yield of grains of corn following alfalfa that isn't fully explained by just that nitrogen benefit. Some of this can be made up by breakup in the pest cycle. We know a lot of the diseases, a lot of the insect pests that we find in our annual cereals um, is not necessarily the same that we would see in say alfalfa. Okay, they're gonna be hosted to two different types of pests. So we see significant benefits there. Um, decreased nutrient leaching. Again, it's holding those nutrients there so that it's more available to the following crop. Help suppress weeds. Again, just with the differences in the growth cycles between alfalfa and our other crops, um, that alone is sometimes enough to break up those, those uh, weed diversity, the weed species that we see, enough to then complement those following uh, species when we rotate out of alfalfa. And overall, we're seeing improvements in diversity, whether this is above ground you know, insects or even below ground uh, bugs and microbes, um, we're seeing improvements in overall microbial diversity as well, which is pretty important. And from this study too, I just wanted to follow up with the picture because it's really just, for me, I love visuals, it hammers home and reinforces um, the story that they're telling. And with this particular picture, um, it's kind of split down the middle. We have the wheat that was grown after alfalfa here on the left. And then in this side, this was the wheat grown after wheat. And these darker areas here are where they had those higher rates of nitrogen fertilization. Uh, and then these more pale spots are where they have low rates of nitrogen fertilization. And so you can see that it took these higher levels, these 200 and 300 pounds of nitrogen to look close to what we had with the wheat that was followed out following alfalfa. So again, it just reinforces that importance of including alfalfa in the rotation and the benefits it has to those following crops. And then one other study, because I wanted to show this isn't just in the West, it's not just in California. We were seeing similar results in the Midwest as well. Um, this was a study that was done by Dr. Dan Understander at University of Wisconsin. And he was looking at the value of short-term alfalfa in rotation with corn. So in this instance, they were growing it for about two years, two production years of alfalfa, then grew corn for two years. And what they found is that when they were growing corn after corn, even with applying that added synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, they were seeing slow decreases in yield from that corn, that continuous corn rotation versus if they had alfalfa in there for about two years and then did two years of corn. They also found that they had about a 10% yield boost in their corn production following alfalfa, again, compared to that continuous corn. And so that number is represented here with this corn after alfalfa that represents that 10% yield boost in the corn, as well as the nitrogen savings, because they were not having to apply nitrogen fertilizer to that corn following alfalfa, which they did to that corn following corn. 
So really cool that we're seeing these replicated results across the country. We have some studies out of Utah State. We have some other studies out of the Northeast that are finding very similar results. Doesn't matter if we're looking at corn, if we're looking at cereal grains. Um, again, those, those results are easily replicatable. Repeatable, I just made up a word, replicatable. So now I have a picture here. And if we were in person, I would be asking the crowd, okay, what's going on? This is a field of oats that was planted on our West Salem location um, after alfalfa. And it's pretty visible. You can kind of see the plot outlines here. There's five different plots and I'll even go forward a little bit here and I'll show you these five different pieces of this plot, particular area were treated differently. And it was really cool um, when our, our our trial manager sent this picture and was like, wow, this just really shows the difference and shows the impacts that alfalfa and the health of our alfalfa too can have on that following crop. So what's different? And again, all of this, this um, particular, the oats were managed the same exact way for this season that we're seeing here. The only thing that was managed differently was the alfalfa the prior year. So what we have here, you can see outlined in the yellow, looks like a really nice, healthy stand. And also here in the purple is also nice and healthy as well. So the only difference in how these were, were treated was at establishment, this uh, particular plot here in the red had no weed control whatsoever. Okay, so the weeds were allowed to grow, we weren't spraying it. It was a Roundup Ready for alfalfa for all of these, but we didn't use any sort of herbicide. We just left the weeds there. In this yellow one, we did apply Roundup. We controlled the weeds um, using that glyphosate application. And then in the purple or light blue one here in the middle, again, it's Roundup ready, but we chose to use the conventional chemistries just to, again, have that comparison there. And so again, you can see that there's a pretty big difference in how the alfalfa likely performed when using the conventional chemistry versus the Roundup ready. Again, and this is the same variety of alfalfa between these two. Then these two on the right, the one in this purple, was grown with a companion crop of oats, but it was cut early. It was cut at the boot stage. And then this final one here all the way on the right in the orange had that companion crop of oats, but it was harvested later. It was um, harvested at grain. So again, this really demonstrates the impact that the health of our alfalfa can have on that following crop and, crop and how much um, benefit it can add to that soil depending on its management. So in this case, we can see the differences in that nitrogen credit based on how that alfalfa was managed prior. So just something to take into consideration when you're thinking about and planning out your rotations. So this leads us to our next poll question, Mike. All right, question number two. On average, how much nitrogen does alfalfa supply to the next crop in your rotation? And your uh, choices are 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 75 to 99, 50 to 74, and 1 to 49. And while the uh, results are coming in, I just remind listeners that you can type in questions in the uh, control panel uh, as we move along here. Uh, for any of our speakers. Uh, also, if you're interested in the handouts, um, there's also a place where you can download those. So, all right, we've got our, uh, our polls uh, completed here. And it looks like, uh, Emily, we've got 68% at the 100 to 150 range, uh, and then uh, much lower percentages for the other, uh, for the other answers. So I think that, uh, uh, bodes well to the understanding that uh, alfalfa can provide uh, an abundance of nitrogen to the subsequent crop. Fantastic, yes. That is so great to see. And and for any of you that figured it out before Mike just, just mentioned it, we do have the handouts, and so we technically have the answer um, available to you, but I'm glad, I'm gonna pretend that nobody cheated on that one. So. So when we're looking at how much nitrogen is are supplied to the following crop from alfalfa, we have to use generalizations there here. Environment plays a big role, soil type plays a big role, and as we saw in that last picture, management can play a big role as well. But on average, in a healthy alfalfa stand, we're generally expecting about 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre available to that following crop. 
Again, we've seen some instances where it's greater than that. It's closer to 200 pounds per acre. We've seen some instances where it's a little bit under 100 pounds per acre, but that's kind of the rule of thumb, the average that we, we use for that. What's really cool is that research has found that not only is that nitrogen available to that crop the first year out of alfalfa, but we're also seeing a benefit in year two out of alfalfa as well. Obviously not to the same degree as that first year, um, generally cut in about half, 50%, but it's still a huge savings in, in fertilizer costs at least um, with that benefit there, with that credit. We also, if we go back, you know, we look at um, the carbon sequestration conversation and, it, you know, producing these fertilizers, producing nitrogen fertilizer is a carbon intensive process. So by decreasing the amount of synthetic fertilizer we're needing, we're decreasing our total carbon emissions, which is really exciting. Um, we're also decreasing our emissions from you know, applying it, from actually putting the fertilizer out there as well. So this can have an overall net benefit um, to the sustainability um, conversation as well. So Matt, I think you have a study or um, a grower example now as well, where they are a discussion that you had overheard, where they were talking about the benefits of alfalfa in terms of nitrogen to their rotation. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure can. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Message, I think you know every grower that has raised alfalfa in the past knows and and has experienced those rotational benefits uh, that alfalfa brings to those subsequent crops. Uh, as you mentioned. And uh, yeah, I, I attended a, a dairy agronomy conference this winter and the main, you know, the main question to the panel was how can we get every acre on our farm to perform as good as those acres that follow alfalfa? And I thought that that was a tremendous question uh, to, the, to the panel and to the audience of agronomists and dairymen. And much of the feedback was, was for shorter rotations of alfalfa, you know, for those fall seeded acres, looking at three years production, and then turning it back into corn silage and you know looking at four years production for those spring seeded acres and uh, you know as dr message mentioned on the previous slide 150 pounds of nitrogen available for that next crop you know that's a that's a humongous uh, nitrogen cost savings uh, for your dairy and for the farm so and you know another solution that uh, we discussed at the conference was a partnership with neighboring farms to raise corn silage and that gives you the ability to uh, to break up your corn on corn rotation, you know, there on the, on the dairy's acres and get more alfalfa planted. And uh, if I can step on my on a soapbox here for for just a second, you know, and ask a question, why why are we waiting five years to tear out our alfalfa stands? You know, and we're missing out on those nitrogen credits, rotational benefits uh, that uh, you know we could be benefiting from on our farms, and uh, you know, the, it's not as expensive to plant alfalfa as it used to be. You know, if you look on a per acre basis, you know, in fact, this corn is much more costly per acre. So I'll step down <laughs> off my soapbox. So thank you, Emily. I have a couple soapboxes too. So, no, okay. but I think that really that really hits it home, right? The management, your question of why aren't we pulling these stands out earlier, that, that really does play a pretty critical role in this. I mean, we want to be actually pulling them out when the stands are still healthy, if we're trying to maximize that nitrogen benefit and not waiting until we're only at, you know, one to two plants per square foot. So, it's a great story, Matt. Thank you. So I'm gonna finish up my, my portion of this by just talking again about that ecosystem benefit. And I don't wanna understate the importance that alfalfa has in terms of habitat, whether it be for large animals, whether it's for you know, small rodents or whether it's for insects. And I know depending on what side of the conversation you're on, you, know, you don't necessarily wanna see a herd of elk bedded down in your alfalfa field and you don't wanna see voles running around in your field, right? But they are all part of the ecosystem and alfalfa has the ability to contribute and be a significant um, benefit to that, that, that habitat. So, you know, when we look at alfalfa again, we know it's a perennial. This provides a nice stable habitat from year to year that a lot of these uh, animals can use. Uh, there's been research that is looking at, you know, insect populations. And they have found anywhere from 500 to 1,000 different insect species in a single field of alfalfa. That's pretty important when we're talking about impacts to overall biodiversity. It has a high feeding value. I'm not gonna steal Dave's thunder on this one, but we know that it has high forage quality and that can significantly affect animal performance. And then, you know, again, going back to whether that's a deer population or whether we're feeding a dairy cow. 
Um, that below ground diversity, I alluded to that before, but again, we've got research that shows that we're improving overall soil microbial diversity by including alfalfa in our rotations. And then another big piece of that, we know there's been a lot of focus in recent years on pollinators and pollinator benefits. And alfalfa truly is a great contributor and a great habitat for pollinator species. And so we don't wanna be overlooking that. We wanna make sure that we're talking about that and having that conversation. I mean, we have our, our own research program grant um, focused on alfalfa, alfalfa as a pollinator. Um, so again, it's just something that we need to be talking about and having that conversation so that we make sure alfalfa doesn't get overlooked. So with that, I'm going to switch it over here to Dr. Weekly. Yeah, and before uh, Dr. Weekly begins, we uh, will start with the uh, shift over to the animal side and, and ask a quick poll question here. Does alfalfa fill the rumen more or less than most other forages? And you've got a 50% chance of getting this uh, right. So uh, let's let the uh, poll results come in here. Looks like we've got 50% uh, of the people have uh, weighed in on this one. And uh, David, we've got 56% uh, that say more and 44% uh, that say less. So. Uh, I guess you can uh, uh, agree or, or dispel. Okay, great, Mike. Well, uh, that's that's uh, good to see. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we uh, did want to say that uh, since the major end users of alfalfa are ruminant animals, we did want to take some time to touch on the nutritional benefits of alfalfa. And uh, the correct answer is B. Uh, which is not well recognized. So don't feel bad if you answered incorrectly. And uh, let me tell you why this is important. Um, alfalfa is less room in filling, uh, which will promote higher intakes. Uh, it is less filling than most other forages, and that's due to the lower neutral detergent fiber content of alfalfa. And um, this allows the animals, again, to maintain higher dry matter intakes. And the reason this happens is since the alfalfa takes up less bulk in the rumen, there's more room in there for the, al the animal, in this case, the dairy cow or the beef cow, uh, to uh, consume more of the entire diet. Furthermore, alfalfa NDF has a very high rate of digestion. It's higher than uh, all, all the other grasses, or all the grasses which allows it to clear the room more quickly. So it allows it to leave even more space for greater intake of the entire diet. So let me just give you a quick example to uh, demonstrate this. So what I have here on the first line is a uh, typical average alfalfa has about 38% NDF. And it had, that NDF has a 40% NDF digestibility, which means 60% of it is undigested. So if you multiply that undigested percentage times the 38% NDF, you get a quantity of 22.8% of the total dry matter intake that's referred to as undigested NDF or UNDF. And some of you may have heard of this uh, being referenced in the literature and it's increasingly being used as a proxy for room and fill. So again, you know, the bigger this number is, it means the more that the undigested forages is taking up space in the rumen, which means there's less available space for the animal to consume more of the entire diet. So let's look at an example of a grass, which I've used here, uh, an example of wheatledge which has 56% NDF, so much higher than the alfalfa, because I mentioned beforehand that you know alfalfa has less NDF than most other forages. But this wheat lich has a 54% uh, digestibility of its NDF, which is higher than the alfalfa, which means its undigested NDF percentage is 46%. But if you multiply that by the 56%, which is higher than what's in the alfalfa, now you get an amount of undigested NDF in that diet of 25.8%, which is higher than the alfalfa, which means that this wheat is more rumen filling. It's taking up more space in the rumen. 
So it's allowing less space for intake of the rest of the diet. So typically grasses are, are not less filling than alfalfa, they're actually more filling than alfalfa. So again, alfalfa will tend to promote higher intakes than most other forages. Uh, also, alfalfa helps promote higher milk fat production. Whoops, I think I skipped a, uh... nope. It does uh, promote high milk fat production uh, in dairy cattle. And the reason why this occurs mostly is because alfalfa has a higher positive cation exchange capacity than most other forages. In fact, it's twice as high as corn silage and wheat straw. Furthermore, the uh, pectin in alfalfa, which we'll talk about here in a moment, has a very high cation exchange capacity as well. So this high cation exchange capacity actually occurs because of the high level of cations in alfalfa, and these are mostly potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And what these do is it helps maintain a much higher metabolic pH in the animal, which helps support higher milk fat production. So in a sense, alfalfa, in addition to its other qualities, actually acts as a room and buffer. And that in turn will help promote higher milk fat production. It also helps promote higher milk protein production. Everybody knows that alfalfa has a higher protein content than uh, every other forage that uh, we feed to dairy cattle, but uh, there's a fairly high percentage of that protein that is degraded in the rumen. So alfalfa has a higher rumen degraded protein amount, higher most than most other forages. And what this does is it helps support greater milk protein production in the cow. And I'll show you an example here in just a moment to uh, demonstrate that. Furthermore, alfalfa's amino acid profile is similar to milk, uh, giving its protein a better amino acid profile than corn silage or cereal silages. Furthermore, it has a higher lysine content than corn silage, thereby complementing corn silage-based diets. So an example of this uh, has been uh, demonstrated by a study that was conducted recently at the Minor Institute in New York, where they took a fairly high number of high-producing dairy cows and they fed them 62% forage diets. And they fed five different versions of uh, these forages, varying in different ratios of alfalfa hay to corn silage, going from 10% alfalfa hay to 90% uh, to corn silage, all the way up to 90% alfalfa hay to 10% corn silage and three levels in between. Now, even though they were feeding five different alfalfa hay to corn silage ratios in these diets, all diets had a similar nutrient and energy content. So they all had the same metabolizable energy content, the same metabolizable protein level, they had the same rumen degradable starch amount, same levels of vitamins, same amount of minerals. So according to most feed formulation programs, you would expect the same amount of milk protein and milk fat yields across all five of these diets. But what the researchers were interested in, are there some unknown positive interactions between these ratios that would actually cause increases in either milk protein or milk fat above what you would predict just from normal uh, diet formulations? And what they call these is positive associative effects. And what you'll see down here with the true milk protein yields, they did notice a significantly higher milk protein yield somewhere between the 30 to 70 and 50-50 alfalfa to corn silage based rations. So that was very interesting and of course positive. So in trying to explain why that occurred, what they looked at was the milk urea nitrogens, which is a proxy for rumen ammonia levels. And it was much lower on this 3070 diet than it was in any of the rest of them. And it was significantly lower. And that was an indication that the rumen microorganisms were using the rumen degraded protein, the protein that was degraded in the rumen much more efficiently on this ration, which lowered the uh, rumen ammonia levels and was uh, ending up being converted more into milk protein. Furthermore, 
when they looked at the levels of what's called de novo fatty acids in milk, they saw a significant improvement, and that's the two diet or two numbers here that are in red. Uh, on the uh, diets that they also saw the high milk protein levels on. And this is an indication of greater milk fat synthesis from short chain fatty acids that are being produced in the rumen. So what this study showed was that there appeared to be an improvement in rumen microbial protein, well, rumen microbial growth and protein synthetic activity on this combination of Alpha alpha hay to corn silage, somewhere between 30, 70, and 50, 50. Another benefit of alfalfa in dairy diets is alfalfa adds dietary fiber without adding starch like you would see in corn silage. Now, interestingly, the level of NDF or fiber in alfalfa is very similar to what it is in corn silage. It's usually around 35 to 40 percent. But the space that is normally starch in corn silage in alfalfa, that space isn't filled with starch. It's filled with protein. It's also filled with water-soluble carbohydrates. But it's also filled with a soluble fiber component called pectins, which we talked about a moment ago as being very high in a cation exchange capacity. The interesting thing about pectins is they don't ferment to lactic acid in the rumen like starch would in corn silage. Consequently, even though alfalfa has a low fiber content, it doesn't add a lot of starch to the diet that can lead to an increased lactic acid load in the rumen, which can cause the cow to be more prone to lactic acidosis. Furthermore, good quality alfalfa of low NDF and high NDF digestibility can have an energy value greater than most grasses and approaching that of corn silage, even though it doesn't contain hardly any starch uh, at all. It's usually somewhere in the one to 3% range. So you don't give up uh, much energy density and good quality alfalfa uh, compared to corn silage. The last point I wanted to make was that typically formulation programs, these computer software formulation programs that uh, nutritionists use to formulate dairy rations, don't account for all the benefits of alfalfa in ruminant diets that I just discussed. Nutritionists who don't know this will allow their formulation programs to undervalue alfalfa and reduce its level in the diet. However, more experienced nutritionists who know the value of alfalfa in diets, you know, things like what, we, what was seen in that Minor Institute trial, uh, will be make, they'll make sure to include minimum amounts of alfalfa in the diet. And typically that level is somewhere around 20% of the diet dry matter. And that would be equivalent to somewhere around 10 to 11 pounds of dry matter from alfalfa. And that's based on multiple trials. So with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you for um, uh, a kind of a wrap up. Okay, thanks Dr. Weekly. And um, we have a, uh, a, a final poll question here. Um, based on what we have reviewed, what is the most compelling reason for you personally to include alfalfa in your rotation? Would it be animal nutrition, nitrogen fixation, soil health, weed suppression, or nutrient leaching prevention? So those are your, uh, those are your options. Again, I would remind folks that if you're interested in the handouts, um, those are available in the control panel for downloading. Um, also, uh, we'll be uh, answering some questions. Uh, if you've got a question that you'd like to ask one of the speakers, um, you can type those in the control panel as well. And um, when you uh, finally exit uh, at the end of the question and answer period, um, there'll be another little uh, survey that we'd really like you to take a, uh, a few seconds to, to fill out in regards to um, the overall webinar itself today. So let's see, we've got, uh, are we closed? It looks like we are, 40% animal nutrition, 29% uh, nitrogen fixation. Uh, looks like we have about a quarter of the folks that say soil health, and then weed suppression and uh, 
nutrient leaching prevention uh, a little bit uh, down the trail. So I don't know if uh, uh, Emily or uh, David would like to uh, speak to those results at all. Yeah, sure. Um, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, I think that Dave provided a, a really compelling reason why we would want to keep, continue to consider alfalfa in our, our rations. But also, you know, the nitrogen fixation, that nitrogen credits are a really important part when we're talking about our overall cropping rotations. So. Yeah, it was definitely a, a tough uh, race there because uh, all of those are real compellingly good reasons. So, uh, I, uh, no wrong answers, right? Yeah, no wrong answers. That's My right. kind of multiple choice uh, <laughs> question for sure. <laughs> All right, we've got a uh, we've got a few questions that have uh, come in over the course of the webinar here, so I'll just uh, throw those out. And uh, uh, the first one is: Does the nitrogen credit go down the older the stand of alfalfa was? Uh, or when it was taken out. So is a, do you get more credit with a four-year-old stand taken out versus a six? So I assume Emily will uh, want to address this one. Sure thing, and that's a great question. Um, generally, we would say yes, but there's a caveat to that. So if you have, say, a five-year-old stand that's still very healthy, you can still be maximizing your nitrogen credits. Really, the health of that stand is what's critical when we're talking about maximizing that nitrogen credit benefit. So you could even have a four-year-old stand that's not healthy and it would yield less than we would expect. Um, so, you know, going in and looking at our stem densities, you know, if we have 40 stems per square foot, which is close to, you know, four plants per square foot, then we're probably at that maximum nitrogen credit or close to it. But when we get much below that, when we start seeing the declining health of that overall stand, that's when those nitrogen credits would decline as well. All right, very good. Um, kind of a uh, follow-up question from a uh, different uh, Listener, uh, how many seasons following alfalfa will there be a nitrogen credit after five years of alfalfa and how much in subsequent years? So another great question. Yep. Yep. Um, so we have more research in recent years that's evaluating this. Um, we've got pretty strong case for what's gonna be there in that first year. And then we've had some follow-up studies looking at, at year two. Um, I haven't seen any studies really looking farther out than year two, partially because you know we see about a 50% decline in the nitrogen availability in year two out of alfalfa following instead of versus year one. Um, so, you know, if in year one, we're expecting about 150 pounds as the nitrogen credit, in year two, we're probably closer to that 75 pounds. Um, like I said, in year three, I haven't really seen anything, but it's probably getting pretty low where the nitrogen credit benefit um, is going to be diminished. Now, having said that, there are some other caveats, right? So it's an it depends answer looking at, you know, what are we growing after that crop? Does it require a lot of nitrogen? Um, those are all going to be part of that. Uh, conversation, but in general, if we're looking at a pretty normal alfalfa to corn rotation, I would expect that we're probably going to see significantly diminished nitrogen credits in year three or beyond. Okay. Another question. Would alfalfa be considered a long-term cover crop if it wasn't harvested? That's another great question. Um, and, you know, Dave or Matt, if you want to add on to this, feel free. Um, that's what I'm pushing for, to be quite honest. I think that there's a lot of value in alfalfa being lumped under the cover crop term. However, when we look at a true definition of what a cover crop is, it's an annual crop um, that's grown and then terminated, um, usually via, say, green manure or something like that to benefit then the soil improvement. Um, so under that strict definition, alfalfa is not included. However, there are ways that we could manage alfalfa that it would be considered a cover crop under that current definition, which would mean, say, growing it for a year, um, which actually we've done some work with Craig Schaefer, creating some materials on the benefits of that. 
And even with one year, we can see some significant nitrogen additions. We can see some significant improvements to overall soil health. So we can truly be using alfalfa in that strict definition. Now, again, I always go back to what is our overall goal? What's our long-term goal? And how can we improve soil health? And um, really, when we look at maximizing our benefits, having that year round cover, you know, that's all a part of it. And so I think that by utilizing alfalfa in short term rotations, we absolutely can be seeing significant improvements in our overall soil health and our rotations. It's just not going to meet the current uh, worded definitions of what a cover crop is, but we're working on that. All right. Uh, another question from uh... One of our listeners, uh, I'm guessing, David, you might want to take this one. Um, uh, it, it's in regards to uh, feeding alfalfa to beef cattle. Um, this individual is interested in actually grazing alfalfa um, after they take a second cutting. Um, uh, any thoughts on alfalfa in a, in a beef cattle diet and also um, what are the ramifications of grazing there? Sure. Yeah, and I, I apologize. If we'd had more time, I uh, could have talked more uh, in uh, beef, beef cattle applications. But um, certainly, you know, you can get one and a half to two and a half pounds of average daily gain, you know, during the growing season of alfalfa with uh, beef cattle. Uh, there's certainly, you know, more than enough metabolizable protein being supplied there. And uh, if it's a good, you know, good stand with uh, uh, good yields and good rotation of the animals, uh, you know, you can have uh, enough energy there for, for good gains as well. Of course, the, um, the one thing you have to keep in mind is one of the concerns with grazing it. You know, if you're harvesting it as a hay crop, this isn't as big a concern. But if you're grazing it, bloat's always a, 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 con a concern. But it's probably been overplayed. Uh, I know that uh, depending upon where you're located, uh, your uh, local extension specialist can give you good recommendations on how to manage the rotational grazing on alfalfa so that you maintain the, the persistency of the stand and put the, the animals at lower risk for bloat. But probably the two things to Mostly keep in mind to prevent bloat is just make certain that you're not grazing an immature stand. So usually wait until it's just starting to bloom before you put the animals on it. Uh, typically that'll create enough maturity that it's still good quality, but probably less bloat prone. Uh, furthermore, you know, don't put animals on uh, the pasture if they're extremely hungry, try to fill them up with some hay or something first before putting them on there if they're coming off a pasture that uh, may not have uh, uh, is quite a, a plentiful supply on it. Uh, you can also put paloxylene out uh, as, as a, a, a preventative uh, a guarantee. But typically, you know, the concerns over bloat are probably much less uh, it's much less of a concern than the loss potential income by not grazing alfalfa at all. It's a, it's a very low cost way of, of getting good gains. All right, very good. Um, we also have another, actually it's more of a, a comment than a question, but uh, we'll uh, pass it along here and, and David, you can comment. Uh, the uh, comment is average alfalfa inclusion in dairy rations is roughly 20% in many cases. Minor Institute data says 30 to 50% produces uh, the most components. And then his comment is, we've got lots of room for improvement. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think the 30 to 50% in the uh, minor study was... Uh, uh, it's probably in reference to the 30 to 50 percent of the forage portion of the program, which in, in that study was around 62 percent of the total dry matter intake. So the 20 percent that I was uh, mentioning is, is actually on a total dry matter intake basis. So if you take, you know, let's say 30 percent of the 60, that's that's 18 percent, which 
was kind of the minimum. So again, that's that's uh, pretty close to that 20% of the of the total dry matter. If if you think better in terms of 30 to 50% of the forage program, and most forage programs are going to be probably in that 45 to 55% range. That'll get you pretty close to it. So it what's easiest to remember, but uh, if you want to keep kind of a number in your head that uh, might be also pretty easy to remember, 10 to 11 pounds of dry matter from alfalfa, so you can back calculate what that would be in hay or haylage, uh, is probably the minimum amount in order to see that benefit. All right, very good. Um, another uh, kind of very specific question regarding alfalfa and I'll let you guys decide who wants to take it. Uh, question is, how will crop residue or clumps of compost or manure uh, affect planting alfalfa? Uh, and also a comment on spring versus uh, fall planting of alfalfa. Yeah, great question again. Um, so if we're talking about applied residue like manure or something like that, you know, we do want to be careful that we don't apply it too thick where it's going to inhibit that seedling's ability to reach the soil surface um, and then to continue growing. Obviously, you know, photosynthesis is a really important part of that seedling establishment process. Um, so we, similar to other crops, you know, we really don't want to have too thick of a layer. Um, we can have some mulching on top of the soil surface, but again, we want to keep that minimal. If we're talking in refer reference to say um, standing residue that's on that that soil surface when we're trying to seed, you know, no-till is certainly something that we've been looking at. We actually did uh, establish some plots um, in Montana last year. We were attempting to no-till establish alfalfa into an existing pasture. We also had some locations in South Dakota and Nebraska. So I'm excited to go and look at what they look like this year. Um, there are some places that are, are doing this very successfully already, but it is again, and we have to be managing that residue, ensuring that it's not too much and inhibiting that alfalfa's ability to really have that nice seed to soil contact at planting and inhibiting the sunlight reaching that soil surface then to allow for that germination. Um, regarding spring versus fall planting, you know, this is heavily dependent on where you are. Um, we did some research in, in the Western environments, semi-arid environments under irrigation, where we found actually improvements in fall seeding, again, when there's adequate moisture versus spring, we had lower um, weed issues, lower, um, we had that ability to apply an extra uh, herbicide application before seeding. Um, so we were seeing some benefits there and then yield the following year was actually improved with that fall seeding. However, that's not always possible especially if we're talking about you know the last couple of years and not having adequate moisture to even begin to question if we can seed in the fall you know that's probably going to trump that um, in areas like the midwest or the northeast we do have a lot of people very successfully fall seeding where moisture isn't as big of a concern again it gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of avoiding that heavy workload in the spring where we're planting you know our corn or our, our sorghums um, and also, again, getting a little bit better handle on our weeds before we go in and try to seed our alfalfa. And another another comment on that, you know, clumps of, of manure. I've I've personally seen, you know, uh, you know, manure spread that that's uh, clumpy like that prevent corn and and alfalfa from being established. And so, you know, in that in that scenario, I would like to see those, you know, that ground worked and incorporated with the soil, and then and the soil bed to be firmed before planting your alfalfa. Okay, we have a, uh, a final question here that's uh, quite interesting. This topic has uh, come up recently um, and it's, we need a, an alfalfa variety for variable soil and good soil. In other words, very variable conditions. Are you seeing farmers mix varieties together to get the best performance on a variable farm or field? Um, so, uh, I don't know, who wants to take this one? Emily again? Matt, do you wanna take a stab at what you're seeing in sure. your area first? Sure, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd first, you know, I'd reference some of our, our PhDs in our breeding program that, that would tell you that you know, alfalfa is more of a population. It's not a it's not a hybrid like a corn hybrid where everything's going to be the same. You know, parent, 
uh, you know, male and female. So it's more of a population. So what they're planting in the bag is you're going to see differences between, you know, so a little bit of differences between plants. And so you'd already expect to, to see some of that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And we do have, I've, I've have some experience where some people are are planting like different fall dormancies. So they'll plant a four and a five and kind of see what, what makes the most sense. Um, and it works in some areas. I don't see it very common and I don't necessarily see it picking up in popularity. Um, I, like Matt mentioned, you know, we have a fantastic alfalfa varieties on the market and we have new technologies that allow us to plant in some of these more variable soils you know with our new ultra cut technology that has that improved disease resistance we can be planting in fields that historically have had issues growing alfalfa um, and now we're seeing alfalfa really take off and do a great job and then still in soils where we've been planting alfalfa for years we're still seeing really high production um, so i would just say know what what issues you're dealing with in your particular environment, you know, whether it's a phantomyces and anthracnose in the east, whether it's stem nematode in the west, and just be choosing your varieties appropriately based on that. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend going with the insurance policy of trying different, different dormancies. There's very few cases where I think that that's going to be the right way to go. Um, instead, just really targeting, you know, what your needs truly are. Okay, um, one last question. Um, and then I think our time will be uh, be about up. Uh, the question is, this individual has struggled with drought in their area for the past few years, making it uh, really hard to establish an alfalfa crop. Um, what advice might you have for, for that area? Of course, we've had uh, a wide swath of the U.S. with drought the last couple of years. Hopefully that's going to change. But uh, what about moving forward? I wish I had a great answer. Um, you know, the the beauty of alfalfa is that once it's established, it can handle drought periods really well. Um, but the problem is that just like with many other crops, we need to have moisture in order for it to be established. It doesn't require a lot of moisture for it to get established, but we do have to have that period. So, you know, we're not going to recommend going and trying to seed into really parched soils because we're likely going to have a failure. But if you see a time where you're able to, you know, capitalize on, you know, a recent a thunderstorm coming through, um, you know, if you've got some spring snowpack, if you're in that area that that's coming through on and and is um, words are escaping me right now, uh, melting. There we go. Um, then, you know, that's when I would try to take advantage and get the seed in the ground as quickly as possible. So again, that alfalfa has the ability to germinate, to generate those root reserves so it can make it through those drier times. But we do know that alfalfa is going to need moisture for that initial growth period. And so there's some, there's some areas where we've just been having a problem um, in the last two years because they've been so dry, unfortunately. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of parts of the, the Western Corn Belt where they will typically see a lot less rainfall, you know, in the summer and fall. So, you know, to try to get it in, in the ground in, in the spring where you would catch some of those spring rainfalls and, and allow the plant to get established. Like uh, Dr. Mess has said, you know, the, the, uh, the main time that the alfalfa plant is, is subject to the drought stress is gonna be at establishment. You know, once it's established, uh, You've got it. You've got it there, and it'll shut down and wait for moisture, and then kick back and, and keep going. All right, very good. Well, our time's about up, but we'd like to uh, we'd like to thank uh, our friends at uh, WL Alfalfas, and more specifically, uh, Dr. Message, Dr. Weekly, and Matt for uh, participating today.